My name is Johnny Ryan. I work at PageFair. It's a company that works on restoring ad blocked revenue and also on measuring the degree of the problem with ad blocking. So, ad blocking has been around for quite some time. Uh, the founders of PageFair found that it affected them with their earlier website back five years ago. So, we know that this problem has been building up momentum, and it's great that ad blocking is now on the agenda. Uh, PageFair put it on the agenda with every year coming out with new annual reports. So the latest report that we came out with said that the global level of ad blocking had hit 200 million users, and that's got a lot of people taking interest, and that the level of, of damage, the level of, of unrealized revenue through ad blocking for publishers now, not for advertisers, is hitting around about 22 billion US dollars globally. So those figures make people take notice. But the issue has been there and growing steadily for years. What I worry about is that because ad blocking is now the flavor of the month, it may become a big issue and then go off the agenda. What I prefer is that we think about it maturely and over the long term. What we need to think about is that the first 20 years of advertising were ads 1.0 and they're breaking down. And that now we need to think about advertising 2.0 and we need to think about what the principles are that are acceptable really for, for users of the web to be exposed to. So why has this problem happened? The reason is that publishers have a, a keen interest to generate revenue and to monetize the content that they pay to produce online. This is especially an issue for people transitioning into digital, from TV or from print. Now, as they become increasingly incentivized to monetize and to generate revenue, they have allowed, they permitted advertisers to use ever more aggressive and intrusive tactics on their platforms. So you get this vicious cycle where the publisher needs to monetize and the advertiser is permitted to be more intrusive and invasive, and the user gets more annoyed, their experience on the web gets slower, the amount of data snooping that goes on gets worse, and their ability to read or watch this editorial content or video content online is degraded. And what's happening is the publisher loses because the advertiser has misused their platform. And the only reason that that has happened is that the publisher has allowed that to happen. I'm going to answer the question after I answer what I think is a more important question. The more important question is not what agencies should be doing because they don't feel the pain. The publishers are the ones who feel the pain. When an ad is blocked, the ad is never even requested from the ad server. It's like the eyeball never existed. The only person who feels that pain at the moment is the publisher. Now I know this. Uh, Last Wednesday, um, we got together a bunch of global publishers in the boardroom of the Financial Times. PageFair, Juan Ifra, that's the World Association of News Publishers, and DCN, Digital Content Next, and a selection of publishers from across the globe got together in a room to talk about this problem. What was really clear to us was that publishers feel this, and we're not sure that the agencies or even the brands are even aware of it. It's not an accounting issue for them. We're not talking about fraud here. It's a, it's a different set of questions. So the first thing is that I think this needs to be publisher-led, not led by agencies. However, where the agencies can step in is they need to start taking a look at what a world with fewer but more effective ads would look like. Now, we've tested this, right? We have run ads aimed at ad blockers, right? only aimed at ad blockers. We've broken through ad block, shown ad blockers ads, and the ads that we show them are really simple, unobtrusive, Sometimes they're text only, sometimes they're just static images. They're ads that don't annoy people. And what we found, and we're testing this now with, with one or two major players, but not at scale. What we're finding is that users who block ads are clicking on these ads 50 to 100% more because they're seeing fewer ads and the ads that they see are not pissing them off. So agencies need to think, what would happen if we dialed it down and had more effective ads but fewer ads? And that's a big mind change for them. What it means from the brand perspective is, the next time your agency says we're gonna go out and win an award for this, an alarm bell should ring. Because every time you win an award, you do something new that hoovers up some more data, that slows down my laptop, that, that eats into my, my bandwidth when I'm, I'm roaming on mobile or, or whatever. And it's a problem. We need to look at simple, unobtrusive, respectful ads, and we know that those ads are effective at selling product. So what does this mean for creativity in agencies? It's a challenge. This, this says creativity is now getting to a point with ads 2.0 like you've never seen before. 
There's a wonderful quote from a very early, one of the pioneers of flight, he's a, a French pilot. And he said, the great designer knows that he has completed his task, not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. That's what's happening here. Simple is better, right? A lot of people read books about Steve Jobs and you know, what happened with, with the great agency they were working with and uh, how did they come up with all that creative? The answer is simple. The lesson here is that when you're making an ad, you are not trying to show off how inventive the ad is. You're trying to show off how effective the mechanic is at getting people to click through. That's all that matters. It turns out that fewer ads and ads that don't annoy people with their obtrusiveness and the, the degree to which they capture the screen, that's the way to go. Should an ad be jumping around the screen? I'm not sure it could be. And for a creative in an agency, when they're thinking about this question of how am I creative, there's a great piece in The Atlantic a year ago by a guy called Ethan Zuckerman. He's the guy who coded the first ever pop-up ad in the 90s. And the ad is called The Web's Original Sin. It's a mea culpa. Seemed like a great idea at the time, but creative for the short term is not effective in the long term. So keep it simple. This question about what happens when um, advertisers pay a prominent ad blocker to let their ads through, that's an interesting question. I have a few thoughts about that. The first is, it's a totally incomplete form of protection. If you're going to pay for protection, you want to pay for protection, right? And the first thing is that you're not protected if you pay this particular price. There's a lot of people who use even that blocker, Adblock Plus, who are not signed up to that scheme, which is whitelisted ads. So your ads may not get through. But even if they did get through on your own site, if you have a network like Google, for example, it's not going to get through on your partner sites. It's not going to get through in your video ads. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot of holes in that protection. So I'm not sure how valuable it is to pay that price. The second thing is, though, remember that the same company, Adblock Plus, has just released a mobile browser that has blocking switched on by default on iOS and Android. So if you've paid money to that company, you have subsidized the next generation of ad blocking on mobile. Big question in my mind about whether that is a rational or sensible thing to do. On to the second issue. So there's a question about what is a practical strategy for a publisher, for an advertiser, what should you do? Let's talk about a few things you shouldn't do. We've, we've tested this ourselves and our clients have tested it. The first thing, if you ask nicely, if you put up an ad saying, please switch off your blocker on our site to support our content, less than 1% of people do that. That's a really scary figure, right? The second thing that you can do, you can say, you're not going to get to see our content unless you switch off your blocker. So the Washington Post just did that. And we know a bunch of other companies who do it. And we're, we're involved in, in some areas on that question. I have to say that we don't recommend this as a strategy. We think it's a really, really bad idea for any publisher who does not have really unique, really exclusive content. It's fine for HBO with the next episode of Game of Thrones but it's not okay for someone who is just repeating what AP or Reuters has said. If I can go somewhere else and the website pushes me away, I'll go somewhere else. The third thing you can do is play cat and mouse. You can hire a company, one of our competitors will be happy to do this for you, you'll hire a company and they will change where your ad is served from regularly. And so the ad blockers have to keep updating their list. And for a short period of time, this looks like it works. The problem is the ad block community is made up of hundreds if not, well, possibly thousands, of people, it's an open source community who are contributing. And eventually they'll retaliate and block all JavaScript on your website. So we've seen this with people who've worked with other companies or tried this themselves. When you play cat and mouse, what happens is you end up forcing the ad blocker to block all JavaScript and you become entrapped. Every time a major publisher now wants to change something on their site, they have to get that, the okay from the ad blockers, which is an absolutely crazy state of affairs. Now, the page fair solution is a little bit different. We've been looking at this for half a decade. Page fair has been working on it concertedly for three years. So we have, we've patented technology that we're not yet introducing. Before we introduce that technology, the big thing for us is to get publishers to agree on what a set of, of principles that they are willing to abide by should be. And those principles need to be signed off by the trustees of the web and consumer representatives. And once we have those, those, those articulated, those guidelines, then we can look at rolling out a solution that resets this equation, that respects the user, and that pays for the publisher's content.